Leaders of the Group of Seven wrapped up their three-day summit in the south of England. Pledging to promote open societies, they signed a joint communique which promises to provide 1 billion doses of COVID-19 vaccines to developing countries and strengthen climate action, as well as call out China for its human rights issues and curb its influence around the world. Now, all of this appears to state that the West is back, or at least building back, a world based on shared democratic values. The pledges are now committed to paper, but will the words lead to action? We discussed the significance of this meeting and what it means for South Korea, which was one of the four guest nations invited to the summit. To get some insights on this, we turn to Kim dae Chun, professor at Sohang University's Graduate School of International Studies, and John Nilsson Wright, senior fellow at the Chatham House and senior lecturer of modern Japanese studies at the University of Cambridge. Thank you for joining us this morning. And well, Let's start with you, Professor Kim. The G7 uh, summit, which wrapped up just hours ago, it's, well, it's been criticised over the years for losing its effectiveness. And the pandemic last year, it really proved how Western countries were struggling to unite. Do you think they were able to prove their solidarity in the past three days? Um, did any of the agreements uh, made strike you as significant? Well, uh, sure, G7 has been criticized for losing its significance in recent years, partly because there is also G20 that came out after the uh, 2008 financial crisis that sort of gained more of relevance, if you will, and also partly because of, you know, as you mentioned, Trump's uh, America First policy that caused friction between G7 countries. Also, I have to mention that the pandemic has sort of drove the wedge between the U.S. and other G7 countries because of the way uh, Trump had handled the pandemic situation. But ironically, uh, this year, I, I think it's the pandemic, pandemic that is bringing G7 countries together and making G7 more valid and relevant. You know, the, the big theme of this year's G7 was building back better, you know, how the uh, international community as a whole can tackle the pandemic so that we, uh, we as the international community can can build back the uh, liberal international order that is in in this array. Uh, I think every member country and also the other invitees are in agreement with the uh, the urgency of building back or uh, building forward. The precondition for building back, I, I think, is the provision of vaccines in a timely fashion to all around the world. So, to me, uh, the uh, agreements on global vaccine network. Uh, stick out as being the most significant. And I think uh, South Korea has a lot to contribute to, to, to this in partnership with, uh, with the G7 Western countries. So the G7 um, communicate, it made quite a lot of uh, pledges there on numerous issues that are very, um, as you said, very urgent at this time, the pandemic. And uh, Dr. Nelson Wright, well, the G7 communicate, it's, it, it's already drawn criticism that their measures aren't enough um, in terms of providing the 11 billion doses of vaccines that are needed around the world, as well as, um, as well as you know, it's been criticised for its lack of detail on climate action as well. But given the lack of coordination that we saw last year from these countries, would you still say that this summit was quite meaningful? Well, definitely in contrast to the era of Donald Trump, the fact that we have leaders who in terms of their body language, in terms of their uh, focus on cooperation, get on much better than was the case when Donald Trump was president. There's no doubt this has been a, an important symbolic change. But the devil really is in the details. And of course, it was a former British Prime Minister, Gordon Brown, who said this morning that the um, vaccine agreement is woefully inadequate. In his words, um, it's a moral failure. And I think um, it's hard not to take that at face value. After all, one billion doses of vaccine may sound like a lot, but we understand that in the course of the coming year, only about 10% of uh, individuals in the poorer developing countries of the world will have received access to a vaccine in a year's time. And given the, you know, the nature of the pandemic, the speed with which it's transmitted and the appalling levels of the um, fatalities that, that the pandemic causes, you can understand why Gordon Brown would have put things in such stark terms. And of course, we've seen the response of major international organizations, such as Oxfam and Greenpeace, 
speaking out not only in criticism of the failure, as they would see it, of the vaccine commitment as being inadequate, but also when it comes to some of these environmental issues. Um, no real substantive agreement on how best to reduce um, the use of coal. Uh, no specific date when that would end. And even when um, the G7 countries have been willing to talk about cutting global uh, emissions in half by 2030, there's no real, again, uh, plan for how that's going to be implemented amongst developing countries. And therefore, it's no surprise that many organizations like Oxfam and Greenpeace have been so critical. Uh, when it comes to something like Build Back Better, yes, I agree that this is, again, an important shift in direction. If you compare the response to the global financial crisis back in 2008 with an emphasis on financial retrenchment, now we have a very different context in which all of the governments, in principle, are pledged to the idea of spending money crudely to ensure that um, there is support for infrastructure, there is a support for um, using government intervention to consolidate um, and help ensure the continuing economic prosperity of individual countries. The problem here, however, is the absence of detail with no clear financial commitment. So this is a G7 summit, long on rhetoric, but arguably less successful in terms of delivering precise and concrete commitments. So what you're saying is, well, perhaps the pledges were very uh, politically significant, but perhaps not so much, um, not so practical after all. And well, Professor Kim, the, well, after a lot of speculation about will they or won't they, the G7 leaders, they managed to produce uh, a rather strong stance um, on China. Uh, they came together to call out um, its aggressive behaviour as well as um, adopt the Build Back Better World Plan to rival China's own Belt and Road Initiative. But again, um, there has been some criticism about the lack of detail. How determined would you say is uh, President Joe Biden on pushing this through? And what does this mean for US and China relations? Do you see tensions worsening in the foreseeable future? Uh, yeah, to answer your last question first, uh, I, I think uh, the conflict between the U.S. and China will exacerbate. Uh, I don't see any signs of getting better in any foreseeable future. And uh, I think President, American President uh, Joe Biden is very determined to, to make sure that the uh, U.S. will uh, prevail in this competition with China. And, you know, that uh, Build Back Better World, that uh, B3W project can be an important mechanism with which we uh, with the uh, u.s can sort of uh, counterbalance uh, china's uh, belt and road initiative you know belt and road initiative is china's infrastructure building project in southeast asia mainly but to central asia to africa and even to europe uh sure there is a criticism that the, the target countries are being heavily indebted to china because they have to borrow from china to work on these you know, infrastructural projects, but there is little doubt that uh, China's influence is expanding. Uh, the problem is that the U.S. does not have American equivalent of a Belt and Road Initiative. So President Biden, uh, I think, has been preparing for the American version of the BRI, you know, Belt and Road Initiative. And then President uh, Biden and the British uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson basically agreed that the, the nations would work together two nations would work together to invent the uh, Western version of the Belt and Road Initiative. But it seems, seems to me that other European countries have yet to commit to uh, to this uh, B3W, uh, uh, because as far as economic interests are concerned, uh, the uh, European countries and the U.S. really uh, uh, do not really see China eye to eye. So we'll have to see uh, whether uh, B3W can emerge as an effective uh, counterbalancing measure against uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative. What would your thoughts be on this, uh, Dr. Nielsen Wright? I mean, there did seem to be some hesitation for a number of European countries on condemning China in the uh, joint communique. Do you think all of them are going to be on board with the Build Back Better World plan? I think the idea of infrastructure spending um, and the rivalry with China's Belt and Road I mean, there is, a, there is a common sense, I think, that Europe and other countries need to do more. Um, 
We shouldn't forget, of course, when it comes to the question of values, there was an important commitment to uh, addressing the human rights situation in Xinjiang, statements on Hong Kong, statements on the importance of peace and security on the Taiwan Straits. What we didn't see was any binding commitments on human rights. And that's, I think, a measure of how a number of countries, including, of course, South Korea and, um, and Japan, are nervous about doing anything that would antagonize China explicitly. And even the United Kingdom, which has been closely aligned, I think, with President Biden on the China statement, has made it clear subtly in terms of a shift of emphasis that they want to focus on what, um, in the words of one British official, um, we are for rather than what we are against. And that means doubling down on the importance of democracy as opposed to authoritarianism. So there is a I think a general sense that even if China is, if you like, the elephant in the room, um, many of the leaders did not want to be explicit in calling China out in terms of its um, its restrictive political system. Uh, and I think that reflects simply the realities of the need not only to engage and cooperate with China economically, but also recognition of the fact that China needs to be included in addressing some of these bigger issues, including pandemic and climate change. Well, Professor Kim, how do you think um, South Korea should really respond to these changing dynamics? It has, of course, been really tiptoeing around the issue of countering China. Um, you know, Suyong, uh, this G7 is a group of countries that have been leading the uh, international order, if you will. But as I said earlier, the liberal international order has been in disarray because of Trumpian American firstism and also because of the rise of China and its attempt to change the status quo. You know, South Korea is a very dynamic, liberal democratic country. And also South Korea has a very vibrant market-based economy. Uh, we have soft power capability as well. That, I think, is the reason why South Korea was invited to this exclusive and prestigious club of seven countries that have shared interests in preserving and promoting liberal international order. You know, G7 now recognizes the uh, important status of South Korea in the world, and G7 expects South Korea to play a more of a, a proactive role in fighting against the, the pandemic and also sustaining liberal international order. Uh, the expectation is that South Korea will have to contribute more. Uh, and I think uh, playing that role more proactively is in our national interest because we can continually prosper under the uh, liberal international order. You know, if that is the case, our choice is not really between the United States and China. It's not really a picking one country over another. It, it, it's uh, more about how we can preserve and promote our national interests. So that, I think, is the, uh, the criterion by which we'll have to uh, implement, you know, make foreign policy. Uh, I, I hope I, I answered your question in proper manner. And um, in terms of, well, Professor Kim, in terms of really working with uh, the global values and also uh, strengthening the trilateral alliance with uh, Japan and uh, the United States, um, South Korea was very much hoping to um, have a summit between President Moon and, um, and uh, Yoshihide Suga on the sidelines of this G7 summit, but that sort of fell through. And uh, according to Japanese media, there's been reluctance on Tokyo's side. And, uh, they, Tokyo apparently also doesn't want uh, the extra four countries this year to become a permanent part of the G7. Why do you think uh, this is? Uh, it's a difficult question. Uh, to Japan, uh, at least for now, uh, South Korea is a secondary concern. Uh, more of a concern to them is the, uh, the pandemic situation in Japan and how to curb the uh, pandemic situation in Japan so that they can hold the Summer Olympic without uh, wreaking havoc in Japan and also in the world. You know, it would have been really great if both leaders had sat down together and chat for 10 to 15 minutes, you know, to show to the world that the relations between the two countries are in good shape. But unfortunately, uh, that was not the case. Uh, there was only a brief encounter between the two leaders but uh, it, it was not as awkward as it, it was between uh, President Moon and, and former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe during uh, G20 uh, in Osaka a couple of years ago. So I sort of 
take a, a comfort in that. Well, I'm afraid this is where we'll have to leave the inter interview today as we're out of time. But that was uh, Professor Kim Da Chun, Professor at Sarang University's Graduate School of International Studies, and Dr. John Nelson Wright, Senior Fellow at the Chatham House and Senior Lecturer of Modern Japanese Studies at the University of Cambridge. Thank you both so much for your time. Great to be here. Thank you. And to our viewers, as always, thank you for watching.